So, TJ? Huggins. Can you hear me? Yeah. Loud and clear. How are you? Congratulations. Oh, I appreciate it much. <laughs> <laughs> How much sleep are you getting? <laughs> so I've forgotten about the, the sleep part, but... No, even even with the the best baby in the world, which we seem to have right now, no awesome. no crying other than feeding needs. Um, everything's going well. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Hello, Hello. Jeffrey. Hi, Jeff. I'm really excited about this conversation, <laughs> more so than the, the previous conversation. So. Yeah, I agree with you. This one was set up really nicely. Hey, Jeff. I, I kind of enjoyed a lot of it. I mean, the book, you know, I mean, I'm cl I'm glad it's over, but <laughs> <laughs> I get, I need a break too. <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed this last chapter, but we'll wait on foams. <laughs> Although I might order it and dip into it while we're doing other things, it's kind of hard to let go at this point because foam seems like the payoff for the rest of it. You know? In a way, yeah. In a way. Do you have a copy, TJ? Yes, phones? I do. I, I haven't taken it out of the plastic yet. Oh, nice. <laughs> I have all three of them, but uh, <laughs> for as it was in, in French, but uh, it's harder going in French, so I'm, I'm going to get a copy in English, I think. <laughs> I found it right. is slow in French to read, so. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually... Since I did get a used copy, I don't have a, a plastic wrap to unravel, <laughs> but it does seem to be laid out in a, a structured fashion, or at least yeah. many divisions. Um, I think it helped. And yeah, I, I, I'm tempted to even just go ahead and jump into it because it might be another year before we get around to it. And I'm, I, I tend to read early, like I did this chapter, I read about a Mm -hmm. a couple days or a week after the first or our last conversation and now i've forgotten everything <laughs> i'm sure i've <laughs> it's it's going on somewhere in there but i was playing around with the idea of just kind of getting foams out of the way over the summer <laughs> if if orabindo wasn't coming up i might just have done that <laughs> yeah that's that's going to be a it. lifetime of work yeah, yeah. <laughs> once we <laughs> jump into orabindo there'll be everything oh, Jumps out at us. I like that. A lifetime divine. <laughs> there you go. Hello, John. Hello. Hey, John. Greetings, everybody. How are you? I'm good. How's everybody? Doug, congratulations. Good. I appreciate it very much. What a, what a beautiful baby. What a beautiful family. I love that picture. <laughs> and Jeff, just so you know, it's your uh, sound is a little low. I didn't know if you could adjust it. Oh, okay. Um, my volume's up. The honey, I don't know how to adjust the volume. Hello, Marco. Hello, everybody. Here. I'm sorry for being tardy. Ah. <laughs> What's tardy? <laughs> Hello, Eduardo. Hey, Eduardo. Hi, Eduardo. Greetings. There he is. Is it dark in here? Do you want to do, uh, we couldn't hear your voice if you said hello, Eduardo. We're checking in on you. Hi. Ah, there we go. Oh, there we are. Okay. Yeah, my screen was frozen. How you doing? <laughs> uh, good. <laughs> Are we expecting anybody else? Don't know. I guess we're ready. I guess so. Maybe Heather. I noticed she at least 
liked the fact that uh, it was posted. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> so I think she's got a lot of balls in the air right now. That's what it seemed like. So TJ, are you leading us tonight? I am leading you tonight, and cool. I'm going to try to do this without Valium. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I with three beers because it went to his five. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jeff is Jeff is low. Jeff, you're fading out, Jeff. Can you turn up your speaker or something? Oh, we, uh, we lost. Uh-oh. He'll come back. Okay. Hmm. Is this the meditation part, or do we... <laughs> <laughs> I think the angel of silence is passing over us. This is a very sobering go. moment. We're almost... <laughs> this is the last lap, right? Wow. We got another book to go, but I know for this yeah. one. Are any better sound wise? Hmm. It's really so hard to yeah, hear that's you. Really bad. Must be the beers. Well, did, did he drink them or did the computer drink? <laughs> I wonder what's the problem. There was no problem the other day. Bandwidth on them. Mm. Oh, we uh, oh. speak. Up, say, say a few words. Let's hear you again, Jeffrey. He froze. Hmm. Yeah. I, <clears throat> he said something about bandwidth. Maybe he's having a some yeah, kind. Yeah, of... that happens to me every once in a while. It just goes low and. Yeah, it happened to me a few times. Freeze, freezes. Yeah, he's frozen now. And meanwhile, my computer, which started out at one terabyte, which is a lot of data, uh, has about 30 gigabytes, 40 gigabytes left, and it's starting to slow down uh, on this end. I deleted a bunch of files in my trash. Yeah, I deleted my trash can, and uh, that seems to have allowed you know, things to move forward. Uh, but. If some kind of background process ends better? up filling up my hard drive. It's still hard to hear you, Jeffrey. But yeah, can well, you, you can hear us, right? If, yeah. And I could... Well, okay. Well, we'll do our best to listen up. We'll listen real close when you... <laughs> and, and when you speak up, I can hear you speaking. It's just a bit fainter. So uh, that can be corrected, you know, through post, audio post-processing or something like that. I'll just yell when I want to say anything. That, that's good. Project <laughs> to the to back row. <laughs> All righty then. So here we are. We have made it to the final installment of Globes, which is volume two of Peter Slaughterdyke Spheres trilogy for anybody who's going to be listening to this in the future. Um, spheres is Peter's metaphor for human relationships. I guess that's the best way I can kind of describe it. And it's a look at human relationships from the smallest scale, the womb to the largest civilizational worldview. And spheres is a kind of metaphor for interiors and horizons and very fragile and temporary uh, formations of societies and smaller communities. And we are in chapter eight, which is The Last Orb, A Philosophical History of Terrestrial Globalization. So there's your mouthful. <laughs> I tasked myself with uh, touching off this discussion because this is my particular wheelhouse. Um, I like to waste time with unanswerable questions about civilization, cultural identity, world history, and uh, how how the perspectives shape 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 the past and and what we can uh, use them for to look forward. Um, in the forum, I proposed a kind of three point program to walk through Slaughter Dyke's text to have a kind of grounded conversation about globalization, and then kind of at the end look at uh, planetary consciousness or an integral theory. 
Um, Gidley, of course, mentions planetary consciousness as a kind of contrast or alternative to globalization. To what extent is that true? What, what do we think globalization is even before we even get there? I'd like to amend that slightly. Uh, chapter eight, Sloterdijk actually wrote it so well that <laughs> I, I don't have to go into my usual rants and complaints about his writing style. Uh, this was 27, basically 27 excurses, which I always thought he did better. Um, he took a, an idea and ran with it and, and went to an interesting place. So uh, rather than going through it, I kind of pulled three um, big cultural, big histor historical themes out of it. Um, and I'd like to present those. I think what I'll do is present those, turn it over to the group at that point to add themes. Cause I mean, I'm looking historically, other people might've picked up, you know, different things. Um, put those all out on the table and then have a post-formal attack on globalization. I don't think we have to wait for any point to have planetary consciousness come in or whatever anybody has on their mind. Let's just like, you know, see what happens from there. If that is okay with the group. Then Everybody's muted, so I <laughs> Huh? Thumbs up. Yeah, great. <laughs> what I don't want it to be is a kind of TJ recapitulating all the articles he's read over the years. Um, most of you guys have actually been to places on the terrestrial globe while I've been in my metaphysical grove of trees outside the city. So, you know, bring experiences, bring your impressions uh, to, to this but I will start. I wrote these down so that I can get them out without digressing. <laughs> uh, three themes that I heard when I was reading Slaughter Dyke. And again, add, add yours after we, after we throw these out there. Theme number one, terrestrial globalization entailed leaving the abstract orb of the philosophers and acquiring knowledge of the actual earth. This knowledge made possible a significant break with metaphysical conceptions of smooth and perfect symmetries, and the modern age abounds with collapsed certainties in the face of increased cosmological, earth in space, and anthropological information. Earth as the home of human cultures, but nobody had any idea what the real variety of that was until Europeans sailed out and discovered all of this, discovered in quotes, of course. Theme number two, uh, terrestrial globalization is, quote, world history in a philosophical sense. And that borrows a phrase not really from globes, but from in the world interior of capital. I think that's page 28. Uh, it began as a European project, which at the outset linked emerging national states, economics and exploration, and continued into the 20th century as capitalist, colonial and imperial expansion. The world explored through adventure or action directed at a blank lawless outside or unknown, of course, that's from the explorer's point of view, uh, has now become a post-historical entity ignored by regular and regulated two-way traffic. What used to be one-way traffic has now come back, which leads to theme number three. It's reverberations of this European project, especially that two-way traffic immigration, nativist reactions, et cetera, that gives salience, if not clarity, to current debates on globalization. Uh, this is Slaughter Dyke talking, and I'm trying to read page 938 as generously as possible. <laughs> what will be increasingly evident is that globalization was not foreordained. Glib generalizations about the unity of mankind risk reversion to now indefensible abstractions of former orbs. And those are my three, and I'll turn it over at this point, add themes, comments, initial reactions to. Could, could you do me a favor? Could sure. You, could you just repeat the third theme again? Mm -hmm. I just didn't get it all down. Reverberations of the European project, especially two-way traffic, give salience, if not clarity, to current debates on globalization. Uh, what will be increasingly evident, and again, like I said, this is Slaughter Dyke talking, is that globalization is not foreordained. It wasn't a, a historical natural, he calls it, process. Um, and he really talks about attacking glib generalizations about the unity of mankind. And he has a, that passage on 938 that, you know, just really slams that. I don't think he's slamming globalization, but he's slamming like people's interpretation of it as kind of one world without too much problem. 
and I, I said it risks reversion to the now indefensible. He's going back to the abstractions of former orbs if you're doing that, and that's not defensible now. Thank, thank you. No, no problem. That was great. Can, can we chime in now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Does anyone want to go first? If you have something pressing. I'm, uh, I'm, I, was, I was gonna say, um, it's not really a theme exactly, but one of the things that really jumped out at me in reading the text is this idea of circum circumnavigating the globe and the importance that played in moving from a local environment to a global environment. So, um, you know, Vasco da Gama, just, you know, doing that. And the reason, one of the reasons why that's particularly spoke to me is last year I flew across uh, Europe and Africa to Australia. And then I flew back from Australia across the Pacific. And so it was my first time circumnavigating wow. the world. <laughs> and I, yeah, the other way around. And I have to admit that my understanding of the world is not the same as it was before I did that. So I do have a kind of a resonance with this idea that once you, once, once you do that, once you take that on. Now, he's a bit, he says circumnavigating is, is a sport. He says it's a sport. And I can't, re can't remember the exact quote, but he says it's not a philosophy now, it's become a sport. Uh, in his talking about around the world in 80 days. I think, you know, okay, so I was a tourist, so in that sense as a sport, but it had a philosophical impact for me to do that. So um, I did feel that this idea of circumnavigation was a, a key idea in his, uh, in his presentation. <laughs> I would just add to that, I, I agree with that. Eratosthenes figures out the size of the earth with geometry back in Alexandria, whenever um, he had lived. But then Delcano and Magellan actually go around and it's like, oh yeah, we limp back to Spain with 18 people you know, left out of this five fleet you know, expedition. And uh, yeah, it, the world is really there and if the ocean is really a lot bigger than you thought it was. So I, I think the... It, it leaves geometry, it leaves philosophy, and becomes a very real, visceral thing. I, I would, I agree. Yeah, I had um, the first time I went to Europe was uh, on a freighter. We caught the freighter in New Orleans, and we went across the Atlantic, and I think we got up at Rotterdam, and then we we got to London. Uh, but it was about, I think it was about eight days across, and in the eight days, we I saw one ship. It was on the horizon. Um, and we got a storm, which was really horrifying. And, you know, three days we were like going like this, <clears throat> going up and down and left and right. <laughs> it was right out of Melville. You know, it was really scary. They had to stra at, at night they had to strap us into our bunks so we wouldn't fly across the room. It was a really upsetting experience. But I didn't get seasick. But then um, all my trips have across the Atlantic had since then been by airplane. You know, I can look down and even then I can see a boat once in a while. Um, but it's a, it's a three hour trip. And you, it, so it's, but it gave me a really, uh, an embodied sense of the different kinds of time frames that we moderns so much take for granted, um, compared to what, you know, these, these, uh, explorers were up to. So, I just wanted to share that it's it's because it came back to me as I was reading and he, he quotes, he, he refers to Melville a lot and the, what these ancient sailors were doing is, is incredible. It's, it's horrible to some of the effects of what, what they did to, you know, colonialism, you know, slavery and um, capitalism, the, the dark side of that we're still suffering so much from, but we also have to look at, some of the, the the incredible courage of certain individuals to pull this pull this thing off. You know, they must have been a little crazy. Anyway, you got a gleam in your eye when you said that, John. <laughs> well, and it's a public past life recall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
because well, it was exhilarating all that day that feeling of uh existential threat you know when you're in a in a storm at sea it's nothing quite like it but it it taught me a lot about homer and you know melville and all these these uh poor wayfaring strangers you know they got shipped back. well of course when my family came from uh, when we came from england to canada when i was 10 we crossed the ocean on a boat too. Wow. Um, I was 10 and it was just a great adventure. I had no sense of the import of that trip. I mean, later, obviously looking back, I realized it was huge, but at the time it was just this big adventure and, you know, we didn't get seasick. We had all this fun on the boat with all the other kids around and, uh, <laughs> and it was a rush. It was the Alexander Pushkin. So we learned Russian when we were, <laughs> <I> was like, <laughs> it was a real cut out of time in a way. <laughs> wow. So yeah, that's the slow way. That's the slow way. But my parents chose to do that because they wanted to get us adjusted to the fact that we were leaving one world to enter a different world. And they wanted to give us that time to process the the transition that's why they chose to take to use the boat to get there rather than the plane because obviously all the travel i've done since is by plane hmm. well the connection between or, or the transformation of global circumnavigation into the tourism industry uh at the risk of a random association uh, which at this point perhaps is not so much of a risk uh, here anymore. Uh, but it reminds me of uh, David Foster Wallace's uh, essay called A Supposedly Fun Thing I'll Never Do Again. Uh, and it's an account of uh, his experience aboard a, a cruise ship uh, to, to which he was invited by a magazine. I don't remember if it was The New Yorker or some other one. Uh, and so his account is the um, kind of insider view of a hyper intellectual novelist, you know, in this consumer adventure uh, on the high on the seas. Uh, and at times, reading these books, uh, I've, the, I've wondered whether this is a supposedly fun thing that I would never do again. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, you know, that's kind of uh, you know, that's Nietzsche's question of eternal return um, in one sense. Um, but uh, in another, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a question of how you value something, right? Was it, what is the destination you've, you've gotten to or returned to? Has that been enriched sufficiently by the, um, the emanation and return? Right, that you've uh, undertaken and, and completed, that you would start from the beginning, uh, forget everything and um, do, it, do it all over again. Uh, I, I don't know whether that's, uh, you know, I, I suspect, I haven't fully understood that thought. I suspect it's not, it's not really a, um, meant to be taken totally seriously. It's not meant to be an objective kind of philosophical thesis. Uh, it's more of a, a kind of test or a, a question for, for consciousness regarding how, how well it's kind of understood itself or become transparent to itself. And uh, it, as, as we were approaching this, this talk, I was reflecting on, geez, where, what have we been through? <laughs> right? we, we started out at, at bubbles with, you know, a, a child blowing bubbles off of a balcony, such a um, innocent, uh, such a uh, lighthearted, um, scene. And, uh, and now we've come, you know, to the precipice, essentially of world wars and holocausts and um, climate catastrophe and, you know, the, the, our, our contemporary moment, uh, which uh, I understand Soderdijk takes up in, in foams. And um, I just received my copy of, of foams this, this week, I decided to order it, I've been putting off ordering it. And uh, on Sunday, um, after, maybe it was Friday, I was sick. 
uh, I really just couldn't bring myself to do anything more laborious. And uh, I was making an Amazon order and added foams to my cart uh, because I guess in a certain sense, I want to do it again. Uh, but it will be a new variation and, you know, it will be a, um, it will be, well, I don't know what it will be. Uh, so, so I've been reflecting as well on what my own motivations have been to read this. Where did, why, why are we doing this? Uh, and no, knowing what I know now, would I have made the same choice? Um, I don't think that's possible, obviously, to, to, to um, uh, you know, uh, put my, you know, to, to put myself in that same uh, situation. But when I think back upon it, I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, it just seemed like a, a, a supposedly fun thing. It seemed like it would be fun. And um, uh, for, for all of those kind of frustrations, I think it has been. And, and I think it's been because we've done it together and because it has taken place in this kind of jovial circum, um, you know, cir- circumspection uh, that we've, we've shared uh, this, you know, through, through these, through these ser- this series of, of talks. Um, so... Uh, that that sense of a madness or of a not knowing and setting forth, setting out, projecting uh, into truly an, an unknown. Uh, you know, we we've done this virtually. We've done this in this sort of ad hoc atmosphere, you know, created by the forum and by our various interactions and you know whatever context we're, we're interacting in. Um, but it's it's interesting to note, I think, how. Um, how s- something simple and something almost thoughtless uh, can uh, fulfill itself in such profound ways. And I think this has been a microcosm of that. And uh, I'll, I think that's what I wanted to add to the themes. So just a thought there. Um so the certain navigation bit is that you do go and come back, but you don't come back. You come back by going forward, right? So you go forward and you eventually get back, right? So it's not quite, it's, it's a bit paradoxical. It's, it's, a, it's a return, but it's a return in an unconventional way. And perhaps we're doing the same thing with spheres, right? So... We go forward through glo- uh, bubbles, spheres, uh, globes, and eventually foam. Maybe we get back to where we started, but by going forward rather than stopping and going back. You know. So um, the other thing I noticed about this while I was reading it, this is the last book of the series of the last chapter of the book, is I had thought in my mind that bubbles was a kind of portrait of an older world. Globes was the portrait leading up to the modern world. And Holmes was the kind of postmodern thinking about the world. But I realized when I got to the end of this that that's not it at all. He wants us to maintain the bubble perspective and maintain the globe's perspective in our look at the modern, postmodern, whatever perspective. So they're not actually sequential in quite the way I originally thought. They are really parallel or different perspectives on the same thing. Um, so that changed my understanding as I, as I got to this point in, in the reading. Yeah, it's almost more of a subjective, objective, and intersubjective, maybe all three, but then at the same time, they're all completely intertwined. Um, but I guess going back to the themes, I, I feel like he's getting at, at least with the seafaring, the water theme, the not, it's not the earth, it's water that kind of almost going back to the, the vascular reversal that we saw um, 
maybe chapter three, I, I can't remember what chapter, but this idea that we're surrounded by waters and, and in a, a womb-like experience. We don't need a container. We're contained within the waters. Um, but that sort of goes away with this view that um, we're no longer, like, we see Mother Earth and that type of thing, but he's almost saying, at least by the end of, and leading into foams, but at the end of this, he's leading us into a new form of kind of subjectivity, I believe. Uh, uh, leading into the modern or post-historical area. I, I don't know that I'm, I'm confused by his terms at times, but um, I, I like the, so during this time from the explorers, uh, I think one of the themes for me, other than there's the water theme, there's also kind of a new, spaciousness that's being formed uh, we're going circ we talked about circumnavigating the globe so that it's not the infinite outside we're no longer afraid that we're going to fall off the edge of the earth we've realized okay well we can see this this world picture through um, the globe the formation of the actual tangible globe we can sit there and observe um, so that that idea of space really opens up new possibilities and a new newer form of subjectivity kind of the the conqueror mo mentality the um yeah no longer afraid of the unknown or unknowable um and then that leads us i think there was a chapter titled the risk takers or something similar so we're able to go out to branch out to um as Jeffrey and all of you are saying, you, you can go out and come back with a new perspective. But at the same time, we're not risking our life by um, journeying for 80 days across the globe as non-tourists um, or, or two years on a seafaring journey where we're literally traveling the globe daily now. So, But during this time that he's focusing on the, I guess the second phase, um, the post metaphysical is that what he's calling it um where we're able to yeah be risk takers to all the seafarers um and to have a new form of conquering that's about all yeah. i want to say about that i can so yeah my theme i guess the themes are kind of the water, the the new idea of the globe, and then um, being able to be brave, <laughs> risk takers. <laughs> I, I suppose I don't know. <laughs> Con confronting the novel, um, yeah, I think it is post metaphysical um, because, again, like we had said, now you're not trying to uh, derive a world from your thoughts or from the philosophies or from the world vision that you have in this particular place. Now you're actually sailing to places. Now you're actually figuring out that the world's not smooth. It's got, yeah, I think sort of like you said, a jagged edges, it's, it's uneven. It's, you know, and, and it's a real place and it's full of really strange people who you've never met before. And it's all taking place under as well as this is happening at the same time. Um, there's not a shell around you, a cosmic shell around you either. It's now we've discovered infinite space. So you're kind of out there and everything that's happening to you, it's no more, it's not metaphysical anymore. It's, it's viscerally physical. And that's the kind of phase. And then I guess foams is um, moving from grounded earth to the water, the ocean, the world ocean. And foams is kind of an airy quality. Now it's kind of like moving through earth, water to, to air. I think a terminological, uh, perhaps only a terminological issue around the idea of the, metaph the metaphysical. I would argue, or I would, if not argue, just propose a different understanding uh, of, of 
I, I, in fact, I, I might argue, let's say that, that, um, that Sloterdijk doesn't believe in the post-metaphysical. I don't think. I think that he is reconceiving the metaphysical, that domain of thought, that domain of ideation that shapes a um, interior landscape or interior kind of uh, um, architecture um, as no longer feasible in this absolute sense. It can't be, although it's still trying to be in many, in, in many senses, right. uh, the project of total world encompassment and, and domination and conquering. Uh, that hasn't worked. And wherever I think those um, motivations that are, are still active, we have trouble, right? Like that, <laughs> that's the that's where things clash. Um, that's where we get the clash, right? Of the. Uh, and, but I don't. I, I don't think we can escape. I, is Sloterdijk's point? The uh, the need to do that. We just have to do it in. Uh, more real time yeah, and and sort of realistic, and real like space life, right. life congruent ways like the, mm-hmm. it can't be this um philosophical uh um idea about what should be the way that things are what should be perfect john john you've talked about it as the you know the 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 single track future the one the one perfect future um I think the question of integral theory and um, theories of everything, um, pl- even pl- what planetary consciousness might be, those those might have qualities uh, of this totalizing orb uh, kind of idea or uh, move. And I-, I would like to maybe question that. that. That's something I, you know, just to bring into the thematics of what we're doing and maybe disturb. Um, the the um, you know disturb the the little micro orb that we <laughs> we we have uh, so far. Like what what is the uh, what is the metaphysics now? Right, if it's not post metaphysics, uh, but it's not absolutistic metaphysics, and is that planetary? Um, if so, how is planetary different than global? Well, I. Can I respond to that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Gidley said, uh, talking about outer space as the last frontier, she said, no, it's inner space. And our our capacity to go inside and figure things out and sort through our, uh, you know, the, the interior landscapes both as individuals and as uh, collectives, <clears throat> is is very important because our our development has been arrested by this uh, fair forward, you know, out there, and the whole idea of domination and um, using uh, the earth for certain purposes that are now we're starting to wake up to profoundly disconnected and unecological um, and the whole idea of this transhuman or post-human fantasy that we're going to and I've heard I heard a physicist say this <clears throat> that we could uh, colonize the galaxy in a thousand years <clears throat> he also said that there's no such thing as a first person yeah, about that. <laughs> perspective there's only third person <laughs> so I to me I think uh, he's the kind. That's the arrested development. Maybe high levels of cognitive capacity, but that's the kind of arrested development. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call Julius Caesar pointing. stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I, I wouldn't call Julius Caesar stupid. So I agree. It's high cognitive, but I think I responded that he he wrote a whole he his whole book about the Gallic Wars was it written in the third person? You know, <laughs> so right, he could detach right. himself from you know what was right. going on. Right, and it can get it can get a, but I think the. A post, I think what Gidley would say, the post, a post-rational planetary futures would rely a great deal on different kinds of metaphors for time and space. And uh, a friendliness towards, you know, what, what 
Gebser, and we've been talking about the apperspectival, um, that unlike the modern, which is basically pe past, present, future, with, a per with perspective, great achievements, the mental structure, but the downside of, of that mental structure is um, reductionism, and nothing is real unless it's quantifiable. Therefore, it's objective only. Third person is the only thing that exists. Second person doesn't exist. First person doesn't exist. Third person. So that kind of reductive science that dominates our, our culture today is, I think Gidley would say, you know, where we're really stuck in the rest of development of some people. Uh, I don't think that's majority of humanity is stuck. I just think it's a very dominant group <clears throat> um, because I don't think the, the world has been disenchanted to most people. It's just those persons and we all know and love them well, <laughs> you know, most of them in academia or in science or in uh, our, our political systems, these institutions with hardening of the categories. I think they're promoting these um, this uh, disenchanted worldview which I don't think is accurate at all. Anyway, I think a, a post, I don't know what post metaphysical exactly means. I hear people, I think that comes out of Habermas and a, a, a maybe a little overly rational, detached view. Um, I don't know. I, I've just never understood what people were talking about when they were talking about post metaphysical um, because they, you know, they were spouting all kinds of metaphysical ideas <clears throat> and claiming that they were Post metaphysical, so I found that very, very confusing. But I think, anyway, I think that's part of the uh, of a major theme that we've come up with, um, TJ, and some of our conversations online too about um, the, the the difference between globalization, neoliberalism, and what planetarization could be, and how they may contrast and overlap in some ways. And I have to correct some of my own. Um, uh, you pointed out Roland Robertson. Mm -hmm. whom uh, he's also quoted by Schlotterdijk. Uh, yes. As yes. a, as a, so I, and, I, <laughs> and I understand he looks at globalization very differently from neoliberalism. He says his version of, of globalization comes prior to the neoliberal uh, takeover, actually, of that term. And um, so I think he, he means something a little more, well, you would know better than I what he means. He also uses the term glocalization, right. um, which you sort of sort of help define a little bit better for me. Anyway, I think these these are very interesting things: Glo glocalization, globalization, neoliberalism, planetarization, um, and the overlapping magisteria that I think mm -hmm. we're all sort of attracted to because yeah. um, you know there may be other levels that are opening up. Um, meta levels perhaps so we're able to hold all of these uh, uh, different perspectives while maintaining a sense of our perceptual space we have to keep we have to you know that first person perceptual space is primary we can add all these other layers onto it and go meta 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 all we want to mm -hmm. but if we, we just end up in abstractions and more and searching more and more for these uh, arid abstractions I think we're in, in real trouble because I think there has to be an interplay between the perceptual and these different capacities for perspective. And we have to have more than one perspective or we're really in trouble. We need first person, second person, and third person. It has to be fluid and we can't get stuck in either for any particular perspective for very long. So that's my two cents. Well, I was gonna say, so let's lay the historical problem right on the table. These people who um, are pushing for this kind of disenchanted way of the world had benefited from 500 years of capitalist and colonial and imperial expansion. That's the way the modern world has worked. And that's how we have built all these things. Of course, you know, we built the atomic bomb as well in the end of that process, but this is, you know, where people are coming from and changing that is a threat to a certain status quo. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it starts to get political here, right? It always has been. <laughs> political, economic, social, it's all tied together. Cultural, yeah. Artistic. I, I'm sensing that the next 
uh, volume and certainly here at the end of this of this second volume uh, to the extent that Slutter Lake gets explicit. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, he, he is getting more explicit about that. Uh, he is mm. um, beginning to describe uh, what, uh, if not a, pr- a prescription, a diagnosis of what's wrong with contemporary politics. Mm-hmm. And I think it has to do partly with this perspective taking because the, 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 the um, liberal, neoliberal, uh, corporate, uh, you know, the, that Washington consensus type of thinking tends to be a lot more biased toward the third person, uh, you know, one unifying orb kind of, kind of mentality. Uh, and what Soderdijk is saying is that they're totally ignoring what it feels like to live in global, in global reality, in a globalized reality. And that's their undoing. Uh, and, you know, if we were to look at the last election, so you know, that, that an analysis could be made along Sloterdijkian terms, I guess, uh, around what exactly happened there, uh, around the, the, um, the relationship between the, the first person lived realities of people and their felt needs and, and their, the expression of that uh, contra a, a much more reasonable um, uh, bigger perspective, uh, which nonetheless like could not meet like those needs, and, and that disjuncture, like that gap, is, is so profound and so um, it's so uh, uh, dangerous, really. It forces you to question your definition of reasonable just then. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, I'm not... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I think he's done a good job in this last chapter. I was very um, disappointed in the last two chapters. I think it was the, some of the most turgid prose I've ever I've had to read. It's just awful. But I think this last chapter... Um, I think it really, really comes together. And maybe it's because he's very good at these little vignettes. Yeah. You know, his, his inspiration is, you know, it has a, has a good feeling and it just, and it sticks with you. I was fully engaged. I was reading it for hours and I didn't need a break. I didn't look out the window and yawn and wish this thing was over. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a good sign that he, he's, he's not, that he's writing better, that his, his writing is, has, has improved. And, I would hope the next volume it would stay at this level. I would definitely commit myself to it. Um, so anyway, uh, I think he's he's gained, he's earned my respect because I had I really thought he was just he was just getting more and more flatulent, you know, drinking way too much beer and not doing his like you said. It looked like bad, it looked like uh, the worst journal day I've ever had. <laughs> right. If you ever look back at your old journals and say, what the hell was I thinking about? Okay. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what it looked like. But I think he's really turned into a, a real professional. And uh, mm-hmm. if not a visionary, at least I think he's pointing to the need for what I think Italy is pointing to the need for, that post-rational uh, um, sort post-formal. of integral view. I think if he hasn't gotten there, I think he's pointing out in some ways his uneasiness and uh, his his recognition that we're going to we need we need something like that. So um, now, Doug, you said that, that transition. I think he's in between. Yeah. You know, he's in that phase space. Doug, you said this chapter is also pretty much the text of in the world interior. Yeah, there's there's two chapters on subjectivity, which maybe helped me realize uh, kind of the hints that the subjective that he's talking about, um, they were kind of spliced in between, I don't know, maybe chapters nine and 10 or something like that. Yeah, I think you might, okay. Um, And then the second half of the interior, it goes into the interior part of what he's talking about. So this this chapter talks, or or the one we read, the the last Mm -hmm. orb, is kind of the global exterior. And then the second, which I didn't read the second half, so I don't know exactly what it's talking about. It's, but it's more of the, <clears throat> maybe a bridge between all of that and the interior space in relation to globalism or um, the 
conquering of the planet. So, but not necessarily conquering the internal, but maybe how capital right. and all that flows within the inside. Uh, but yeah, I don't know in particular. Have you been reading from this too, TJ? Have you I'm, think, I'm thinking of ordering it. I don't have it yet, but I'm thinking of. He has some stuff in here that isn't in. Um, okay. Yeah. Chapter eight. Yeah, I read there's no, there's no images. So the images I, I prefer in the Spheres series. I think that's right. what makes it so beautiful. And uh, TJ, you mentioned that an image, at least the last one you posted, can yeah. <laughs> speak a thousand words. And some of his images literally do that. You'll, you can sit and ponder on an image for an hour if you really wanted to. Right. At least I can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, it's very creative. His writing is really good in this one. And when did that come out? Uh, this was in 2000 and first published in 2005, the okay. English edition 2013. And you can feel, I don't know, I think a lot of the, what we've read has been sort of, you know, before 9-11. And this is- That's after. what I was gonna- and yeah, It seems that, like he, he came out of his trance, you know, and sort of started to like focus his attention. But globalization theory in general did that as well. We, we had Francis Fukuyama with the end of history and liberal capitalism wins the day. Samuel Huntington coming a year after that. No, no, we've got problems that are still, you know, in the world. And then his clash of civilizations thesis is interesting until 9-11 hits. And then it was like, ah, I told you so. And we kind of, it's, it's like a different, it's like a whole paradigm shift with, with, that, with that. Yeah, I think Anthony Giddens would be in that camp yes. too. I remember reading him talking about the nation state isn't big enough right. to handle uh, all international the, problems, all the international, yeah. but, but it's too, it's too big to handle local problems. Right. <laughs> so, and he's, you know, he's pointing this out in the, in mid in the nineties, you know, so it gave the impression, everyone has the impression that the, the bus is running, but there's no driver, you know? And I think that that hasn't changed much. I think most of us are still feeling that, um, or maybe it has changed. Maybe it's more moving towards a more totalitarian fascist, American fascist, fascism. Um, we'll find well, out. Yeah, it's history, so it's going that way. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. There's maybe no driver, but there's a ticket taker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna ask Eduardo if you wanted to Chime in. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I think these last chapters are very self explicative. It's more like yeah. read and see the images, you know. But uh, today I think a little about of the expressions that Slaughter Dyke used to put the name of the book. Uh, a bubble, globes, and foams is almost like we can resume all life or all human existence in these three words. But uh, I think this last chapter is the only thing that they call my change was the part when he mentioned the idea of fortune and some kind of view of fortune. And I remember a little bit of Machiavel. Instead, I don't remember almost nothing of the, his book, but I remember that he says that uh, it's almost like he teaches some kind of virtue to the prince. And this virtue is some kind of opportunism, is some kind of veracity for power, audacity, take risks, or some kind of hunger, hunger for food, you know? And he also says that, uh, it's almost like the fortune is some kind of lady or woman that wants to be catch. So this is some kind of pre-modern view of men, I don't know. 
because the modern man is more like a man of calculus, you know, this idea of science images. And there is also, I read this, I think some kind of paper, I don't remember. Uh, Michel Montaigne was some kind of the fathers of subjectivity, moder modern subjectivity, with this idea of the eye interior and the exterior eye, some kind of public and private. And I think in this paper, the text say the text says. Uh, that for Montage, the subjectivity is some kind of almost like a balance. Is not does not uh, take distance from your interior eye and the, your exterior eye. So when the fortune or when the opportunity appears to you, you're gonna use calculus, but not uh, a calculus which some kind of 100% previsibility is some kind of life experience, you know, about you taking kids, marriage, church, living society. So all those opportunities, when they comes to you, you're gonna say, oh, you're gonna be like prepared to catch them. And the other part of the, globes that call my attention in these last chapters is when he mentioned Heidegger. He says that the modern man or the modernity is some kind of time of the world images. And this makes a lot of sense because this idea of globalization is almost like some kind of architecture of the globe into the space, you know, abandon a little bit this metaphysics and cosmologies. It's almost like we're trying to recreate the globe into space and shapes in life of the man. And I separate here a little part of the text of Heidegger. Let me see. Yes, it's here. I think it's page six, I don't know, six or seven. He says that uh, knowledge as inquiry, inquiry asks the body to account of how and to what extent it can become available for the act of representing. The research was the entity which can be computed in advance in its future course or counted as something past. In the previous count, nature is wiling. In retrospect, the history, the history is equally disposed. Nature and history becomes the object of an explanatory representation. It counts on nature and tells the story. It is only that is, it is recognized as existent, which in this way becomes object. There is only science in the form of research when the being of the beings is sogged in such an objectivity. This objectification of the entity is consumed in a representation that seeks to bring every being before itself in such a way that the calculating man can assure itself of the being, that is to be sure of it. Therefore, there is only science in the form of research when and only when truth becomes the certain of representation. Descartes' metaphysics defines for the first time the entity 
as objectivity of representation and truth as the certain of representation. So I think he's talking about the modern science né? and Zotterdijk says in some part of the book, I don't remember the chapter, that some kind of expeditions around the world, some kind of scientists, uh, they are now taking notes of the topology, the fauna and flora, and almost like painting the world to their own eyes. So this is a little bit of, I don't know, the beginning, but probably 16th, 17th century, things like we call today botanic, uh, ecology, biology, anatomy. So the main now is the being that creates images and transform those images that already exist. So if we think in navigations or globalization, this start with almost like Europe, you know, the Occident, uh, the West, that we call here Occidenti. And I think the globalization can see as some kind of occidentalization because now the man develop machines and develop procedures and methods to get or to find or to explain uh, some kind of temporary truth. It's not more like a cosmological and metaphysic of truth is like a center, is God, like points become centers. I think for him, this no longer exists. It's more like uh, it's almost like everything is some kind of big anthropology because the man creates, transforms images. So he is the starting point and the end line of this. So he puts himself uh, as self like a, a object, like an image. So the, hum the humanism is almost like uh, a static and moral anthropology. And let me see. Yes, there is other part of the text of Heidegger that I separate here. I think it's page nine. He says that the basic process of the modern era is the conquest of the world as an image. The word, the word image now means the product of representation production. production. Man struggles there for a position in which we can be the being that gives the norm to all other others and established parameters. Since this position is established, branching and declaring as worldview, the modern relationship with the being, it is decisive, unfolding becomes the dispute between the worldviews, but not between any of them. The struggle only occurs between those who have already decided which the highest degree of firmness, the most basic fundamental position of a man. In the struggle between worldviews, man, mo man mobilizes, mobilizes the unrestricted violence of the calculus, planning and cultivation of all things and he does so according to the meaning of this struggle. Science as a research is an indispensable form of the self-installation of the world. One of the ways in which the modern man launches itself 
to the consummation of its essence, which a speed unsuspected by those who participate in with, which the struggle between the visions of world, the modern age enters for the first time in the decisive part of this history and supposedly subjected to the longest duration that we can expect. And I think that's it. The, it's almost like this second book is almost like a reconstruction of the world to the Zlotterdijk view. We pass first for some kind of religion, cosmological, theological beginning. And now we are uh, some, somehow uh, putting the globe into structures, even like the science. And I, I think that's it. I think for me, uh, foams, I think, can be more uh, interesting than this book. I like this book, but uh, some parts, are, it's a little, it's so much effort to read, especially the part of Dante's Inferno. 20, 100 pages, no, but, 700 ago. <laughs> yeah, and more 700 uh, in Forbes, <laughs> but I really enjoy this work of Slaughterdike. Probably the Forbes, as I read in now the, the title of the book is plural, it's ferology, I think. Let me see. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to respond to what you said. Uh, I, I don't know much about Heidegger, and I, I attempted to read his paper on technology, and um, I grabbed some information from it, but I um, didn't fully grasp what he was saying because um, I didn't have the time to focus on it. But you said... And I have in my notes too the modern age as conquest of world as image or picture, and I, that that kind of ties in. I have it under my modern subjectivity notes here, and somewhere I read I think it was Slaughterdyke stating that we're we're now or rationally motivated actors. And kind of going back to the telecommunication aspect of it, we we can all, I, I think he said this, I don't want to quote him on this, it might have been somebody else I read, but we, we activate our inner Pope in a certain sense to where we're influencing, um, we're erasing, we want to erase the doubt of everybody around us that we, we do, as an individual, have the right way to go. And... We want to establish dogma, not necessarily religious dogma, but our own perspective. Um, and going with this, there's also the removal of the master, the removal of God or um, removal of the one specific political figure you can trust. Um, so if their reality does not fit, then that's when we, we start our revolutions and it, Slaughterdike or whoever this was. Uh, so I apologize to whoever wrote these words, but um, the revolution isn't necessarily like a revolution in, in the modern day sense, but it's, it's the, it's there to kind of disable the oppressive, the destructive or what's kind of depressing us. Uh, so that leads us into, yeah, I, basically what you said. Um, so I was kind of going along with that aspect of it, but I, I'll i stop there. I don't know too much about Heidegger. Um, but that, yes, I, uh, just to finish my part, uh, I think probably the foams, like uh, uh, 
It's more like uh, it's almost like the, this whole process is simultaneously like bubbles, globes, and foams. It's not like uh, it's not like a, a ladder of construction. It's more like parallelous representations, and probably in the foams. I don't know, but I guess in but it's almost like uh, the bubble in the globe in the in the globe is almost like they have some kind of inner space, but uh, not necessarily share the same same space. It's almost like uh it's like a wall like my room is isolated but he is collected connected and isolated at the same time with my bathroom it's almost like some kind of membrane because with the modern man with this vision of microscopic vision of biological vision uh, we see that if we get close to the things, all those things, they are not like rock, like something solid. It's almost like in this constitution of the matter has some kind of holes or some kind of porous density that things can excavated or dig inside to live you know almost like some kind of uh, some kind of unicellular, unicellular life like some kind of bacteria or something like that and probably the we're gonna see he's talking about the capitalism i think so what i see a little about of this contemporary capitalism is almost like we don't build any more uh, structures in some kind of shape Did he freeze for you all as well? Yeah, he just froze. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. shall we wait for Eduardo or should we move on until he comes back? I had some comments about, because uh, I, I, I agree that, that there's this whole thing about image that was in Sloterdijk's text here. And also about time synchronization. He talks about the global world is being synchronized as distinct from the older world, which is asynchronous. Uh, and I had to say that I had some thoughts about, you know, I guess because I'm writing science fiction and in a post, in a world where you're no longer confined to the surface of a sphere, asynchronous comes back. So if we develop colonies on Mars, even the whole process of trying to build a colony on Mars takes us back to the world of sailing ships and, and uh, voyages that take years to get someplace. So we're so it, we're in this very special time right now where it's this synchronous world, uh, but it's a very unusual time in the history, right? So um, the the other thing I wanted to say, and I don't want to disturb because we were on a roll here, and I didn't want to sidetrack the talk very much, or the exchange very much, but. Um, so this, uh, this thing about the post metaphysical. So what I want to do is I want to digress slightly and I want to bring in a cross channel connection to the weird science podcasts. So one of the weird science podcasts that they did was on Philip K. Dick's work. And it's based on an arc article of Philip K. Dick of which they gave an excerpt of the article, which I read and what I found interesting, uh, I mean, there's a lot in that article, and I don't want to go in it, but what I found interesting about it is that Dick writes 
about this idea of parallel universes, you know, and so we have this idea that came out of physics in part that that universes that the universe splits along decisions and and there are these parallel universes. But he said he says if you have these parallel universes, there's nothing to stop a person, a, a, a being, from existing in several of these parallel universes at the same time, that they superimpose upon each other, that they overlap. And so that we're not in one universe with these branching, but we are in a packet of universes. And I find this idea in a way dovetails with this idea that you were talking about of um, post metaphysics, right? In a, in a sense, it's a, it's a, it, it blows up our traditional ideas of metaphysics as a single, and it ties into this idea of a multiplicity of points of view and a multiplicity of possibilities. So, anyway, I just I found it really intriguing this idea, and uh, it it seemed to me in some ways relevant to our discussion on integral theory um in a in an odd kind of way so. <laughs> have something to do with the quantum foam, a quantum the quantum foam. foam. <laughs> well yeah we have faster than light quantum <laughs> i i think that's the difference between the imaginary and the imaginal um and there's a lot of talk gidley talks about the vision logic and that there are different kinds of logics that might apply. In, and, and part of having a vision is finding a logic to go with it <clears throat> so that you can implement it. So there, there, there's always the concrete and the abstract. We move from the concrete to the abstract to the concrete. And in different um, universes, that's going to be a different kind of arrangement. Uh, and our, the imaginal, unlike the imagination, is a real place and it has an a aspect that's objective. And so if you've had a lucid dream or um, an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience, um, you know, uh, or a telepathic experience or synchronistic event, the whole notion of a, of a divided inside-outside is called into question. So I think I think you're right on there about that, uh, you know, these latent capacities, which I think we already have. I'm walking down the street and I'm operating in several scenarios. And I'm sure most of the people around me are as well. <laughs> you know? uh, we're using our imaginations sometimes in extremely destructive, destructive ways. But I think we can, change, we can train ourselves to become more sophisticated and more tuned in to very subtle shifts in consciousness, what I would call polyphasic. Right now we're very fixated in a, in a, in a monophasic world. Uh, but I think uh, studying Aurobindo and studying um, multiple logics and continuing to read poetry and produce art or enjoy art, I think these are all ways for us to train ourselves in uh, creating a more, polyphasic culture that could nurture us rather than getting addicted to a monophasic aspect and um, projecting that onto, uh, into, onto our technology, which amplifies that monophasic perspective. And um, that, that's where I think we, we start to live in, in profoundly unecological ways. So I'm, I, it would be my expectation when we start to train ourselves in this, these imaginal capacities, we would still be using, we'd be using different kinds of logics. And um, I think we'd be having a whole lot more fun. And I think this is where we would be not wanting to escape the planet because it's so polluted and so depressing. Uh, but we would want to, you know, share these internal landscapes, these metaphorical landscapes. And um, that would be a, an area of entertainment, perhaps, that would make the internet look really primitive. So I think that we would be probably working in small groups, but that could be, we could amplify certain healthy trends as we get more adept at tuning into the polyphasic. And um, we could start, 
I think harnessing this energy that is right now is just, um, I think, uh, disorienting most of us. So we're not able to ground these, um, these imaginal higher energies. They may come into flashes once in a while, and, but rather than um, create a, a stability, a new kind of stability that we can then share, it tends to destabilize us because we don't have any clear reference points because we're so addicted to this, you know, one size fits all kind of consciousness. But anyway, that's a great theme. I hope we can develop that further. And Slaughter Dyke and Foams does have nine anthropogenic islands that he talks about. Hmm. Um, the chirotope, phonotope, uterotope, thermotope goes on, but so there's, <laughs> there's all sorts of aspects that he's focused on that will tie in with what I assume he focused on in bubbles. And so as you're walking down the street, you can maybe take in your own aspects. And then also one day, maybe next year, you'll be focusing on Slaughter Dyke Island. So. Well, yeah, well, I think, I think if you love another person or if you love a writer, you start to see the world through their eyes and you start thinking, Oh, I know what this person would like. I, you know, you would, you, because you're, or I know how this person wouldn't like this. It's because part of you is able, has that kind of fluidity to step into their perspective and their perceptual space. You can imagine walking a mile in their shoes. And I think those that we are, we can tune into others, I think, in a much more sensitive way. Um, if we weren't so driven by, the, my, by having to monetize everything and think about our time in such an impoverished way. So that yeah. clock time becomes the only time. So I think Gebser and the, the theorists that we've been sort of exploring, I think Schlotterdijk is, is moving through this phase space towards something like the post forma. Well, that brings me back right to the beginning. I, I, I think what you just described, Schlotterdijk would call that transference, right? The limits, of, the limits of my world are set by how much I can turn what was exterior into bring it in to, to my space. But not, I'm gonna, not in the mode of conquering, though. It, it, no, 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 no. In the mode of, of loving. That, right. that, that's, that's the beauty of transference. Right. But please. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, that's all I, I was. Uh, I was going to, I wasn't going to, but I'm going to throw Robertson's definition of globalization out at this point. Please do. Because it's, it's very simple. And it's the compression of the world, the, the world becoming simply one place. Not one cultural zone, just one place, one, what I say in the form, kitchen with lots of chefs in it. And it's the intensification of consciousness that this is taking place. And that's why his field has got all these arrows going every which way, because there's no set direction. There's no, it is a very polyphasic type of, it's, it's almost like he's done an AQAL with this. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, Slaughter Dyke is kind of pointing to this too, because I, um, I, don't, I won't read the whole thing. It's on page 938. He launches into this long thing about terrestrial globalization not being a natural thing. You have all these cultures and all these peoples and we're not, in his definition, we're like not naturally joined together and we're not, we don't have a natural affinity for each other because we're so different in, in, so, in such different cultural spaces. But he's saying now we're in the world where that can't be ignored anymore. And right. how do we deal with that with that positively? Right. Because, because we, 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 we tried the conquest. You know, has the world been made in Europe's image? Well, yes and no. Yeah. Superficially or liberal capitalism, you know, it's it's there's still all the all the common, all the people who define their own social spaces in very different ways. And that like you, Johnny, you said that is not going away. No. That disenchantment is, you know, the disenchantment's not universal. So then, but then what do you do? Because here's our situation. There he is. <laughs> All well, right. Well, welcome back. <laughs> yes. We just went around the world. Come <laughs> <laughs> <And> we're back. <laughs> I, I would like to pick up on a, on a, on a couple of threads. Uh, and uh, Eduardo brought to mind a number of themes as well that uh, I had noted while reading. I had 
appreciated while reading and then forgot in, in the you know, period between the reading and the conversation. Um, but I'm going to try to work my way back and try to make sense of some of these notes that I've taken. Um, TJ, so Robertson, the world is one place, but then the intensification that, that goes with it. Uh, I want to make another connection to an, an author we read previously, Jude Curavan. Because she makes an interesting distinction, I think. It was helpful to me between the cosmos, which she calls cosmos, and universe or universes. See, in her view, there's one cosmos. You can't have multiple cosmoses that, by definition. Um, but you can have multiple universes. And what you know, we define as the universe that we live in we, meaning modern humans, uh, from the Big Bang to the present moment, could be coexisting in, in many different minds, let's say. Uh, and <clears throat> so that kind of brings back to this um, idea that Sloterdijk introduces. I think it's at the end here, but he picks it up again in Foams of what he calls the second ecum ecumene uh, yeah. right i didn't totally catch what the first one was uh, I, unless that was the the sort of globalized metaphysical globalized view and the second one is the actuality resulting from these multiplicities sharing a a common planetary space if that's that that's that my kind of initial understanding of it um just real briefly, mm. Akumine, William H. McNeil is a world historian and he uses that. And there have been several, it's just kind of when a band, it, Rome, um, what, uh, the Kushan Empire of the Middle East, India, China, but they're, the trade be among them makes that kind of one closed system, which excluded the old world because, of course, there was no contact with the, 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 Az the Mayans, the Aztecs and everything on that side of it. And then for him, the second would be after 1492 and the closing of that, but that's, that's a historical thing. But an Akumine is just basically a system that has a cosmos that has multiple universes in it. God, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so step back one, one step further in the conversation, I'm kind of trying to work mm -hmm. backwards. Yeah. Um, we have the idea of the last orb, right? Uh, and the Last Orb is a play on Nietzsche's La The Last Man, which was the theme that Heidegger picked up on in the, the, um, in the piece that Eduardo read from, which I wanted to make sure, I wanted to uh, verify, was, was that the age of the world picture by Martin Heidegger? Yes. Okay, so, so an essay called the, the Age of the World Picture. There's another essay that was... I think reference as well, which is uh, the question concerning technology. Uh, that that I think Doug, you may have been referring to that, and Heidegger's idea there that well, essentially what you read that technological consciousness or attempts to order beings and put put each in its location, have them all permanently unconcealed. This is another theme that Sloterdijk, I think picks up and sort of fills in Heidegger really well because Heidegger doesn't talk about history at all uh, in the sense that, you know, common people understand it. Um, but he fills in this, this mania for unconcealing everything, for giving everything a location in a, a verifiable, uh, uh, you know, unitary uh, spatial, you know, map all of the conception, which takes the shape of these maps. It goes on for a while about the maps it's like the globe is a great idea, but it's not as practical when you need to know, you know, what, uh, what lands uh, you, you own uh, and what deals you you know, you, you, you might be able to transact with other owners. So um, there, there might be a, there might be a, uh, Soderai ta talks about these possible philosophies, right? That, you know, don't exist uh, yet. Um, or don't, you know, only exist hypothetically. But there might be a philosophy of like the evolution of ownership through all this, because that's 
that's that, that conquering that it, it transmutes into our modern regime of, you know, or modern understanding of property rights uh, and uh, international rights and, you know, the, um, presumably uh, space rights because that's, we're going to have to figure out who owns the moon, who owns <laughs> Mars. If, if Elon Musk, Musk gets there first, does, does Tesla own Mars? I, I, how does that work exactly? Um, who owns the water? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's settle Antarctica first. <laughs> um, it's, a good, it's a good question. Because property, but, of course, is one of Neil Ferguson's six killer apps of Western civilization by which, you know, the first uh, modern system, you know, came to be what it is in all of its glory. So now I guess we have to do the same process again, or hopefully we've learned our lesson next time. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, um, one of the things that Nietzsche says about the last man, which uh, Heidegger uh, alludes to in, in that uh, quote you gave, uh, Eduardo, is that the last man lasts the longest. And, you know, in Nietzsche's view, this was um, uh, sort of an aesthetic state of affairs. He wasn't a big fan of, uh, you know, modern um bourgeois uh commodified uh comfortable uh you know humankind now uh, he, he wanted to assert a more noble ideal some he wanted to affirm the, the you know the the, the the man in nietzsche's uh view who um created themselves realized themselves through this create creative transformation and he has, he has a metaphor in uh, this a parable uh, in uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra of um, the, the way these transformations occur. Uh, it, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go there uh, right now, though. Um, so the, the the last man lasts longest, the last orb, and and then moving into foams, this you know state of. A perspectival madness, this uh, you know, pluralism, uh, kind of uncontained. Um, there, there, there's um, there's there's a kind of uh, bittersweetness to, to this 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 moment, I think, because this is not like it's not a first second third historically this is the other thing you said eduardo it's not that bubbles happens first and then globes and then foams it's that the foams has been there all along and now it breaks out but it needs to be contained within a kind of ecumen or a kind of permanent you know humankind and that seems to be taking the shape of the uh you know the, the kind of ordering or the assigning of all beings to commodity functions right so if we were to follow that logic I mean, here's where i think i'm going with this where this may come come back um you know what we've gotten what we've come to for uh the constitution of our of our bubbles of our spheres is in the absence of the metaphysical whole it's the insurance uh and the risk analysis, right? Uh, it's the the kind of entrepreneurial projections, which then have to stabilize into some kind of sure bet, right? So you can hedge your bets, you you can distribute risk. Uh, you know the calculating uh, man that Heidegger talks about that you uh, presenced here. That that we could imagine that proliferating and going on for a very 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 long time. Uh, and and some kind of order emerging from that, the second ec ec ecumene, where what ultimately becomes commodified are universes. Uh, and we have a vast marketplace for realities, for personal realities, for shared realities, for livable realities. Right? It's, we're going to need like a kind of technology of architecting like the shared interiors. And um, 
I think this has something to do as well to make another connection point in the sort of meta, you know, me mentality of the forum is I think it has some, something to do with the meta modern idea and the politics of the meta modern. Because the politics of the meta modern are about letting people have their own universe, basically. Having enough kind of objective social stability or some, you know, Scandinavian kind of uh, uh, sustain presumably sustainable uh, um, arrangement, you know, amongst physical beings, such that metaphysically, we could all be doing whatever we want. <laughs> and, um, you know, who, if, if they're not wrecking the same planet that we, that, 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 that we all share, who cares what people are doing in their, in their, in their spare time and in their private lives? I mean, that's, that's, I think, the principle of phones. It's the principle of apartment living. Uh, and it seems that the, the politics or the, um, that as another essay you linked to TJ was the, the one on, um, uh, Sloterdijk, Latour, Cosmo ethics. Oh yeah. Like we, I think the politics that might be emerging here, uh, is one of, uh, trying to establish some kind of common order that's sufficient enough to allow people to totally disconnect from each other in in all other meaningful ways that's what did you get a chance to read that one i started into it and um and i was gonna say i didn't want to make anything require reading but if the group if you get it if you get a handle it's uh, marie eve moran and it's cohabitating in a globalized world i believe is the title of it um they won't let you directly link it but it i'd really like to hear what people's thoughts were on that one because she really ties it together and that's where the air, water, uh, earth, water, air kind of um, imagery came from. But at the end, she she balances it with Latour. Um, and I think it's exactly that. I think cosmopolitics was exactly a way of, look, these these people on this side of the fence are not going to agree with you, but you still got to live with them. So what's what's the new rules? Yeah, really good article. Of all of them, that would be the one I would recommend. Hmm. I have a train going by. By the, do you hear that? Oh, is that? Yeah, is that... <laughs> yeah it's a block away. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, well, I mean, here's the I guess last thought, just to wrap that up. I mean, and maybe so, these might be in my last statements on this book. You know, for now, um, I'll say that you know, as someone who uh, has sort of ventured forth as a, um, a cosmic entrepreneur um, with the kind of mania around, you know, that that entails and uh, the, uh, you know, sort of sallying into the unconcealed uh, <laughs> and um, universe uh, building, you know, Jeffrey, you may relate. Um, uh, it's, a, it's such a kind of exciting time actually for that. <laughs> You know, because we can do that. And at the same time, um, we, I come back to this one place. Like, we, a, a, a cooperative is a, a discrete entity. Uh, a reading group is a discrete entity. Uh, a planet, but, but, you know, a planet is a discrete entity too. But, but um, these, these perspectives, like the... the you, the, the universality and the particularity, right? These have to become like mutually perceived. And this is where I, I think maybe I slaughtered, like loses, like it doesn't quite reach that sweet spot of realization because there's some spiritual realization, I think that is necessary to live in the infinite and the finite at the same time. Uh, that is not easy. <laughs> That's Nietzsche's type <laughs> rope walker doing it for entertainment purposes there. But, but uh, it, 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 it's, it, I feel that we're kind of on that, on that tightrope, um, even in just in these conversations, even just in my, you know, figuring out what I have to say. Uh, and um, the only other thing I'll add, just another connection point, perhaps random, perhaps not. Uh, there is this device in uh, um, 
Ursula Le Guin's novel, The Dispossessed, which is, which allows the different worlds to communicate with each other. It's called the Ansible. And, uh, the, the kind of, you know, goal, the, 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 um, one of the, one of the objectives of the hero of that novel, um, Shevek is to discover a theory of time that allows him to invent this, this device that allows disparate worlds separated by light years to, to communicate with each other. And this is a literary um, project. Uh, and, and so I wonder if part of what a sort of, you know, cosmo ethics, a, um, a, a cooperative, a cosmic cooperativism is, is creating these transmission capabilities, right? These communication capabilities amongst, from, uh, between different worlds. Like, and, and there's something literal about that, actually. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so I've learned a lot about the idea of the cosmos through this book. That has been one of the most important things that is, that I've gotten out of this book is a philosophical, intellectual kind of history of what that idea has meant to people over the millennia. And, you know, the, it is of course taken on many different meanings. It's, it has, in Jude Curvan, it has a kind of quasi spiritual meaning or d- d- totally spiritual meaning in Neil deGrasse Tyson, not as much or in a different way in, in a more kind of secularized way. Um, but there, uh, but it, it has, it, it comes from something, it comes out of some desire, out of a desire to define the horizon, right. To think what the, the, the think the, the ultimate, think what's far, farthest, think what's um, truest, uh, think what's most, you know, beyond one's own capacity to think. Uh, and so I'm, I'm like appreciating what we're doing or trying to do on a totally different level than I was when we started here. Uh, this sort of cosmopoasis. Uh, and having multiple universes, it, 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 to, you know, to, to constitute a cosmos and, and each co- universe seeing the cosmos it, itself differently, and yet it being the same thing. That's, uh, and I feel like that's kind of profound. And, um, and so, uh, you know, foams to me is not the best metaphor to end on. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I could do, I, I think we may need some, some other metaphors. Um, I'm, 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 I'm sure we, we have them already or can come up. Well, with. we donuts, I think was the, the <laughs> one that Jeff, <laughs> that's going way back. Um, I think it is profound. I think that the, um, one of the interesting things though, is that that desire for the horizon is kind of, I wouldn't say countered, maybe balanced by, it's also a desire for connection to the inside. So it's kind of like a, a dual, a dual pull almost that, that, that keeps you in balance. Um, you had mentioned universalism and particulars. Um, that's another one of Robertson's points. You can't have one without the other. You can't say, you know, a universal value without, especially talking about human cultures, without recognizing that you're bringing all these particulars together, but then you can't champion particularism without realizing that you're championing it for a specific point here within the universal. So it's like, it's how do you say the integral is about, you can't really separate that ultimately. So when you're building, you're building a cosmos with multiple universes, that device that allows you to transfer information from one universe to the other becomes very important, or you really don't have a single place. I, I, I was going to say, I think um, I, what you said, Marco, I think it's very beautiful what you said. Um, in a way, it's a response to the question I posed some time ago about if we were together as a book, going to write a book project that was post Lotter Dykian, what would it look like? And I think that what you're grasping is something like that. It's a, it's a collective idea from this group that's different from what Slaughter Dick is proposing. Um, I have to say that um, what I'm hearing, and I think 
So um, Eduardo mentioned Machiavelli and talked a little bit about Machiavelli. And the other writer I'm thinking about is Hobbes, because this idea that people don't fundamentally get along with each other is very Hobbesian, it, which is right back to the roots of where modern civilization and its legal and ethical structures came out of, was the Hobbesian vision of humanity. And um, I agree with you. I think it's missing a piece to do that. And, uh, you know, we all agree that, yeah, there is a Hobbesian component to the world, but it's not just a Hobbesian world. It's got these other elements. So, uh, John, you were talking about love. And although Slaughter Dick goes long, long and large about love in, in bubbles, um, somehow it doesn't seem to have crept back in in the later part of the work, right? So, um, I mean, he has this co-immunity idea, which is one of the one of the reasons why I was inclined to read Foams, because I, I think it comes back in on Foams, as I understand it. But what I'm hearing from your sort of comments about it, in a sense, you're talking about it's like you divide up the modern world into two pieces. The piece that is the co-immunity mechanisms that you have to put into place in order to deal with the rest of it, which is a Hobbesian population. And therefore you need the co-immunity in order to have a livable world. And that's a very pessimistic, in my view, understanding of the way things are. And it's not my view of the, of the social world. I think that there's more going on. There's more social cohesion. There's more, there's more of a force going there. And, and it's spiritual in some sense, whether, whether, I mean, you can not necessarily Christian or, or Buddhist or any particular religion, but there is a spiritual component to, I think, to, as you say, the sort of living between the, infinite and the finite right so that's uh i agree i think that's a hundred percent part of the problem with the slaughtered ike in view so anyway i think we've come to a a much deeper understanding of what slaughtered ike is about and where we have difficulty with his approach and uh, you know and maybe we need to finish the job and do foam but with that informed by that perspective as it were after the life divine, <laughs> I need a, I need to change the pace. But, but, but what you Immun- immunity? What you, what you said? <laughs> what you said, Jeffrey, really triggered uh, something. You talked about co-immunity and um, his use of the immune system as a kind of melat. He, he uses, a, I think, a mental model, a deficient mental model uh, of the immune system as uh, a military strategy. Uh, a way of uh, defending uh, a fight flight uh, uh, kind of response. Um, and I think that comes out of, you know, immunology, which is full of military metaphors and, you know, doing surgery, cut it out, chemo, antibiotics. It's a, it's a war with the microbial world. And I think we're starting to see the, the, the limitations of that kind of view of the immune system. And I think there are many more sophisticated thinkers like Donna Haraway and who are talking about um, it's much more messy and fluid and dynamic and musical. Um, the metaphor of uh, sound mind, sound body, a musical metaphor, um, I find very compelling that the immune system isn't about establishing and defending an identity at the biological level. It's about making meaning. And that's much more, I think, an artistic project. And I believe that kind of immunity, which is much more like dance or music um, or or show and tell, getting to know you, getting to know more about you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think that's the way to go. Um, But I think we live in the, I'll just tell a story though, when we're talking about Cosmo ethics, and what this could mean for post-formal planetary using vision logic and imagination. I had a very close friend 
I knew he was very gifted psychically. I sensed this about him. And I read about mutual dreaming. So I suggested, why don't we have a mutual dream? And he said, cool. So I said, okay, the next time I have a, a lucid dream, I'll call out your name and we'll meet. And he said, great. So we, re we rehearsed this, we made an agreement. I was in a lucid dream and I remembered this um, plan and I called out his name, Ed, Ed, Ed. Then all of a sudden I ended up in this like dungeon and it was really dark and dank and it felt like a prison. And I saw, um, I saw Ed there and he was in some sort of sadomasochist sex scene. And I said, hey, Ed, this is a dream. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> let's go fly. You know, let's go do something else. And uh, he said, no, I'm happy here. Go away, you know, leave me alone. And I went, okay. And I thought, well, how am I going to get out of here? And I noticed there was a refrigerator in the corner of the room. So I opened up the refrigerator and there was a light bulb. So I sort of merged my dream head with the light bulb and I was able to blow up basically, go into this golden light experience, which, which is much more satisfying. But anyway, the next night he worked in a bar in my neighborhood and I went, I asked him, I said, well, did you have any dreams last night? <laughs> didn't say anything about my experience he said oh yeah i was in this uh, i was it was a sex party and there's lots of drugs and you know lots of sex and we were having it was a little sadomasochistic it was a lot of fun but this little kid came up to me and he said hey hey this is a dream let's get out of here and i went oh yeah and what happened then and he said i told him to go away <laughs> and so i never said anything um but I also noticed that I felt, oh, shit, you know, I don't know where my boundaries are in this particular setup, and I don't want to pursue this anymore. A, a month later, uh, he had a, an overdose on heroin, and I went to the emergency room. He was in the ICU, and he was there for about, oh, many, a month. He went into a coma for about six weeks. But I was able to tune into him while he was in a coma. I, I was able to find a mutual space where I could sort of monitor certain um, certain affective zones he was in, and I could report that back to of the people. But it was a very, uh, but it brought my attention to what, co what cosmoethics could possibly mean in a world where people are more po attuned polyphasically to one another. Um, it's not just about, sharing passwords you know <laughs> it's like uh you know you have the you can have bonds with certain people and you can establish priorities and values um but it's often messy and there's how many of us on this planet are so pure and pristine that we could um meet another person with a and guarantee that we will bring our best to that occasion um I think there's a shadow in all of us and we just have to, and I don't think we're anywhere near. So that's why I'm like saying <clears throat> this whole idea about um, t t telepathy and um, transpersonal experiences and, you know, these, um, these liminal zones, um, you really have to have a, a real clear intention about what you want to do and what you want to, what your desired outcome is. Um, and then even then, if your intention is very clear, there's no guarantee because there are multiple players um, and not just humans. There are non-humans as well. So I think but I think it's very interesting in that particular episode. It taught me a very, in, in an embodied way that he, he, I had appeared to him as a, as a child. Uh, he did not register uh, my, my grown up identity. Um, and I understand that there's probably something very age regressed and very childlike about me in that episode because I wanted to get out of that place. But he, but I think there's, um, I think we may be visited by all kinds of entities and intelligences, enormously vast. Some of them are nefarious. Some of them may be uh, very uh, hospitable and 
and, and nurturing. Uh, and they may be people in, on the planet who are alive right now. And that we are in uh, our waking lives in the communication with. But we may not recognize that in these liminal zones. Because I think we take on a much more symbolic uh, character. And our, uh, um, I think the, the physical world is wonderful because it's so, it constrains us. So we have to learn these real basic kind of moral lessons. You know, if you step on someone's toe, it hurts. So don't step on someone's toe. <laughs> you know? And then we can go and see these perhaps uh, transphysical uh, senses, these transphysical physical spaces with a little more sensitivity. I don't, I'm not anywhere near that. I don't think cosmoethically at all. Um, I'm, I'm making it from day to day as best I can. And I think a very corrupt system. But I think I get flashes of, and I'm sure we all have. And I, I hope we could, you know, create a, a, a enough of a, a shared reality where we can find out what we really value and pay attention to how we're paying attention. Because I think that's um, extremely powerful. And that's the way humanity has always pulled it off. It's, this isn't really something new. It's actually about taking that deficient mental structure and de deconstructing it and then going back and retrieving the magical and the mythical and the healthy mental so that we can, I think, move into these, these post-formal uh, spaces and, and refine our, our, our cognitive and our moral capacities. But I mean, it's a, I, I'm, I'm amazed that we've gotten as far as we have, but boy, <laughs> are we up against it. So thank you for that. Because <laughs> I'm working on this, you know, I, but I think this, reading together these very difficult texts, as frustrating as this has been for me, I think um, helps, helps me um, work with uh, you know, my, my left brain. <laughs> you know, I think you need to have a left and a right brain uh, to wow. function well. And if we just, uh, and, and so that's why I think these, these this, this rational, healthy, working with um, the linguistic side of my nature helps me to negotiate more effectively. Um, so, and I hope that's true of each of us here. And I think that's why we're attracted to these really bizarre texts that we've been exploring together, you know, non-easy, non-obvious what's going on. But I think it's a kind of training. So, good luck to all of us. <laughs> Phrase that comes to mind: If, if we can't do cosmo, cosmic, cosmo ethics, we may need idiot, idiot ethics, <laughs> <laughs> child ethics. Uh, um, we may be thought of as idiots because we walk into a, a terrible dream and say, "Hey, this is crazy. <laughs> Let's have another dream. Let's dream something better than this or different." Absolutely, than this. absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's how powerful we we are. I mean, we, we got rid of, look at what happened with slavery. It was a horrible civil war, but after four years, it collapsed. I'm just saying there were lots of people who made lots of minor gestures, little acts of kindness and love, and it accumulates and things shift. But before that happened, people said, you know, we'll always have slavery. It's inevitable. Just get used to it. And Slaughter Dyke is very much the major gesture. It's it, it's whole presentation is is about major things. It's not about the minor. So. Right. I think that may be a weakness that he has, maybe. But I I did recently have a child, so I went back to Bubbles and read the chapter on the womb and the placenta and all that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that he definitely reaches zones that are not major that I don't think many people have ever thought of. And um, it's very enlightening in a lot of ways or whatever term you want to use, but just being able to jump into that space with them. And maybe that's where I, my participation here on the cosmos cooperative was my, my first uh, group was with the reading group here for 
uh, globes. And I did, I didn't even know if I would read the book. I had, um, said, huh, it sounds pretty interesting, but I really embodied, um, the first few chapters, the, it was winter time. And I mentioned I had the, this, this little pot belly stove over here, um, and sitting and chatting with my, my wife and really experiencing the, it's only a half circle, but <laughs> we're a small family, so it doesn't matter. But just the following along with him with that, um, I felt, felt I would have done that the same thing with bubbles. And, but just carrying that idea, the, these ideas with me as I walk down the street and um, imagine what, what foams could possibly be, it's, it's very useful um, in some sense even if I'm never going to sit down and have a discussion about Slaughter Dyke ever with anyone else in my life, <laughs> it's, it's going to be there with me um, and for the better. Well, TJ, you, you let us off. <laughs> the circle must return. Circle comes back, but have we gone forward the whole way or? <laughs> There's so much more we could say. I feel like we just got started. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a big topic. Uh, well, you know, and j not even just academically, but um, it's what for me, uh, Slaughter Dyke is, has grown on me, but I mean, I think the, a lot of things were illuminated in the last chapter that kind of makes the rest of it kind of fall into, you know, fall more into place in it than it did when I was slogging through it. Um, <laughs> it the community is a real, it's a real thing. I mean, the, the womb is an a priori condition that you don't have any control over, but it, it shapes you in ways that you, you, you can't control, but that then you use to go forward. And I'm just at every stage of this thing, family, small community, small town, city wall, agrarian empire, nation state, world empire. And now we're at the global level. And some of the some of the opposition to that and there's reasons for it we didn't get into all of that but you know political and, and economic and, and all the rest but to kind of say oh well history just has to stop because we like it here it, that's just not the way it works and slaughter dyke's conception of post history is really interesting in that there's no <laughs> Uh, the, the, the room for action is gone. So now we have this place and we have to have foams and a kind of structure that contains everything and keeps everything, everything leaning on everything else so that it, that it stays up. But it's, he's, I, 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 I kind of hear both like, like two ways that he's going with this, where you know, the foam is the, is the structure without a structure, but also that kind of history and, and political action have stopped, which I mean, I'm not sure how he'll reconcile that in the, in the third volume. Um, my thing is, yeah, history doesn't stop and it's not, it, it might not be for the good, but you know, it doesn't just stop where you want it to. And a lot of the opposition to change comes from that, but you know, it happens and <laughs> you know. Yeah. So. Hmm. Is that a wrap? I think it's a wrap. Yeah, read the read the Moran article. Read the last one. Cohabitating in a globalized world. If if you can get a hold of it, it's. I I will, I will. I I, I want to. I'm not going to read this now because I've been sick and I've been. Uh, I don't trust my yeah. voice right at the moment. But that the last the very last section the transition on air conditioning, mm -hmm. uh, which we didn't touch on. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought it was quite beautiful actually, and. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that it was in kind of a brush stroke, uh, maybe setting a certain tone for what might come next. Uh -huh. uh, and so, if 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 I uh, once I'm once I'm feeling better, I may do a little recording or something of this. That's just because uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, because the the other piece, Doug, you mentioned how certain things he when he when he does, when he gets there when he does it well, it's it's really quite something the, the the one on the the situation the roman amphitheater that, that that vignette was quite moving to me 
as well. And I, I felt that I wanted to vocalize it in some way. I wanted to resonate with it. The, the, the thing that he gets to, too, in this chapter, so not a rap. There's a, this is the excess. This is the more than. Um, is what is it that brings, what is it that binds people? What is it that we share? If it's not a divine presence, and I'm not convinced that it's not a divine presence, but he's not, that's not his, his theory. Uh, he says it's the situation <laughs> that we share. That, that's the fact that we're in it together, if you will, in the, you know, the, the meritocracy uh, of the, <laughs> you know, the, the formless foam. Um, Another funny uh, excursus. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well done. <laughs> yeah, excursus on ex- excursus. <laughs> um, yeah, like what is it just to be like surrounded by shit <laughs> and like and trying to breathe, <laughs> right? <laughs> This is this is what the infosphere. This is what but, like but yours reality. doesn't stink yeah. though. That's the that's the principle. <laughs> yours and your community that you grew up with and you know for all your life that doesn't stink. It's everybody else's <laughs> that you have to worry about. <laughs> right. The, the, hence the need for air conditioner. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know purification systems. What whatever it is. Right. Uh, or or gardens. You know uh, trees. Um, and the I like that actually. And the length of climate change and the ecological disaster that we're living in. So, right. also, right. Aaron, he brings it in specifically. So, he does. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get back to films when we do, I suppose. And, well, so uh, Life Divine is our next big book, right? Yeah. Uh, now, I have, I have, uh, I had a conver- an interesting conversation uh, by way of transition with a fellow named Matteo Needham who is associated with the um, Aurobindo Association um, and some other associations. He was, he's a really cool guy. We, we talked for a, a bit and um, asked him about, you know, he was asking about what we've been up to. He, he saw the, the discussion on Aurobindo. He wants to read the book with us. He's read the, the, the book a number of times, and, he's, and he participates and uh, coordinates other reading groups on, on Aurobindo. Great. He thought the 50 page a week pace, which was recommended by Eric Weiss, was way too fast. And uh, that was just his initial reaction to it. And so it gave me pause around what our schedule is. And Wait, wait it's once a month? How are we doing it? Once a month or every two weeks? Well, I was rethinking. Well, I, I, I had uh, added a proposal to the discussion thread uh, that with, a, with a schedule going until November that would bring us through the whole book and it would be a sort of steady clip of 50 pages a week, roughly. Uh, so it would be a kind of strongly intellectual, I think, experience because we'd be making our way through a text and we wouldn't, you know, we'd be in some cases discussing multiple uh, sections at the same time. Uh, we wouldn't be doing it, I think, in the way that Matteo ha- had in mind or, has uh, you know, d- done or witnessed in other, other contexts, which is much uh, sh- taking much shorter t- bits of the text and going deeper into them. And so there's just questions around pace, around ambition, around minor, you know, maybe other paths, other ways of, th- of reading, multiple ways of reading, polyphasic ways of, like, I, I, I'm kind of in an open and ambiguous and uh, like not at all, like, driving the bus down the, the road kind of uh, mood about it. Can, can, can I ask a question of, of TJ? TJ, you read The Human Cycle. And Douglas, you've also read Life Divine, have you not? Yeah, that and the synthesis of yoga. Right. I, other things. I, I, I have read uh, some of Arabendo. I haven't read any of, the, any of those books, but I've read other bits and pieces of his. And um, I find him much easier than Slaughter Dyke. So that's my personal feeling. I don't know how, what you guys feel, but I think this group can handle 50 pages a week. But if we can't, if we have the option to slow it down, I think we should. <clears throat> because I don't want to spread this out for a year and a half. I, I, I think, I think what, we need to do it in, in a chunk of time. And I think, how many months were we talking about? Three or four? 
ending the beginning of the end of October, beginning of November ish. So that's four, four and five months. Four, five, about five months. Five months. I, I think ones. what we've thrown out there um, with an introduction to the text and then getting a feel for it and then jumping in after that. And even if you can't keep up with the 50 pages, uh, there is a lot of not necessarily repetition, but recapitulation within each chapter kind of saying, OK, well, you, you might notice each page or each uh, his writing is a, literally a p paragraph equals one to two pages. And a lot of times that's him kind of going through the entire process that he's already gone through and then introducing something new. And then the next chapter, he'll do the same thing, but not necessarily in that structure, not like he's intending um, or just doing that for fun, but it was part of a, the ARIA. That's what I was uh, going to ask. So it was originally segmented a monthly kind of thing that he did. And he later went back and, re-edited, um, added in things that he felt would be useful. At least that's what I'm learning now as I dig deeper. But yeah, it, he, it was a very profound personal experience uh, when I did read it. And uh, he yeah, did the I same. feel what we have set up is going to work out. I was just yeah. wondering if we slow it down a little bit, could we read uh, related texts? And, you know, so that would be another way to do it rather than just going straight through human, human divine. Life divine. Mm -hmm. Slow it down, but belief in other texts that enrich the reading. Well, well, I think that's what Eric Weiss suggested at first, did he not? He was first to do uh, ha the, the first half of Life Divine and then follow it with a half of another book. I can't remember which one. It was um, the Synthesis, the synthesis of, yoga. of Yoga. So he thought you should do half of half of divine and then half of the synthesis. But, but isn't there a poem as well? Isn't there the, 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 the savagery? Savagery, yeah. yeah. Matteo, Matteo just gushed about Savitri or Savitri. Uh, he, he thinks it's a beautiful poem. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm inclined to believe him. Uh, and, and I want to read poetry too. So can we uh, introduce the text? Yeah. We can read the life divine and the poem alternate. You know, so that we're reading poetry and then the, you know, something like that would be interesting. And, and we're also working on setting up alternate groups like the, what TJ, John and I did um, with the SD magicians, just simply having those, those options. So that'll open up um, possibilities there. So I feel. So we could have little, uh, little laboratories. Um, well, I was looking at them um, and you do. Yoga Nidra, Doug. I think you mentioned you, you practiced that. I, I just that came. Point. Yeah, I just I just came across a very good hour and a half Yoga Nidra practice on YouTube, and I'll post it because I think if if you haven't done any of that, I think if you did, even a you know, a, you know, a few times a week, you would understand. I think what Arbindo is talking about with these the vital and the the subtle and the the causal, the absolute. Um, anyway, I think I think they're actually very accessible. It's this polyphasic coordination. is It's very accessible. It's not that hard. So I think um, a little bit of practice goes a long way. And I think if you have, have a text, <clears throat> it, it'll make a lot more sense, I think, or a bend of it. Because what he's talking about, he had spontaneously in, a, in the prison cell uh, he had a few meditation practices, and he hit the jackpot. <laughs> a very transformational experience, and the rest of his life uh, came out of that episode. So anyway, I'll, I'll just post that, and if anyone feels like doing it, I, I find it uh, Yoga Nidra is extremely powerful. I've been doing it for years, and it really works. So I think it would be fun to, to combine, like, the an experiential part with the readings and with with the doing the poetry i think that would be a lot a very creative use of our time i'd i'd appreciate it if you posted it yeah a thought a suggestion or an idea um and maybe this is also this is more than that it's just an expression of potentially a preference uh 
I'd like to read those 50 pages kind of per session, but not have weekly sessions, but not have monthly sessions either. I think that that's too much time. A weekly is a little bit too fast. If we did every other week 50 pages and get through whatever, the first book or the first book or part, uh, that could be to be determined, like see how it's going and whether we want to continue all the way through or switch to synthesis of yoga or something. But every other week, really, a more, let's say, left brain kind of, you know, uh, discussion, reading. Uh, and then the alternate weeks, and could be at different times, could be, you know, scattered, whatever, poetry, yoga nidra, uh, other offshoots, right, that enrich the, the main trajectory. And I, I don't know, again, I haven't mapped it all out, and I think I won't, actually. I'll let it unfold. Uh, but uh, to have this consistent, like, this time continue, and... Uh, there might be a few other people that join us. They may, we may want to create multiple groups. Um, but for me, that, w- that would work. Whatever else happens, it would, it would work, especially this summer with, you know, wanting to be out and not want to be, want to be in front of a computer all, you know, all the time. Um, every other week. That sounds good. 50 yeah. pages twice a month. Yeah. Or every other week. Well, we can... Depending on yeah, how, the week would be yeah, on probably to that. test that out. But yeah, mm-hmm. plus a little extra stuff. I, I like that. I think that's a good compromise. All right, I, I I set a start date for I think three weeks from now, actually. So not it wouldn't be an all the alternate week to this. Uh, that is in the forum, and I, I I shared that with Mateo, Eric, and and a few others. So I'd like to stick to that. Let that be a starting point with no reading required. It would be kind of see who shows up see what the interests are. Um, you know, we have a, a minimal structure, a minimal sense of our direction and our, our pace. But, you know, so that could be the backbone. Uh, and if, depending on who shows up, other things want to happen, I'm happy to help that occur. I'm not, I don't want to pre-plan it. And I can't. I don't have the energy to uh, anymore. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that would be the date on that is, let me pull it up for the record. If Mardo, are you planning on being around for any of this? You sound uh, like you had a busy life, but... <laughs> no, I, I'm a little sleepy. Almost sleepy. <clears throat> but... Uh, we, we won't put you on the spot. <laughs> it's an open, open invitation. <clears throat> well, I think what you decide, I, I mean, but... To read the old book, I think I'm not gonna be remember too much too much things of the book. Let's say in October. I don't know. I think we're gonna we're gonna lose a little bit the possibility of discussions only if we take some kind of notes. I don't know. Well, we have the forum to continue uh, Sloterdijkian studies too. Uh, these threads are all, you know, open. Is that are you referring to that to um, Life Divine, reading Life Divine before foams? I'm sorry, what? We're talking about foams, about doing foams after we do Life Divine, right? Oh, right, right? Yeah, so we haven't specified a date for, for f- finishing, starting up foams. If that's what Eduardo was talking about. I'm, I'm not sure I understood, that's all. Is that, is that what you're talking about? The, the, the c- continuation of foams yes mm. well we'll see what happens <laughs> i bought the book <laughs> uh i might not it may be irresistible um uh, i i think it will be 
for personal sanity, I will. Uh, I cannot. I will not. I will not commit to phones uh, yet. Uh, I, I take that back. I'm committed to reading it, but but not not immediately. However, if you read it and you want to kind of like TJ did with the human cycle, uh, he went. Uh, he kind of read ahead of the rest of the, you know the others in the group. He read the, the Human Cycle by Sri Aurobindo and then posted his notes almost similar in style to your yeah. notes because you write, you know. These are the books we're talking about. These three yeah. volumes, Savitri, Life Divine, Synthesis. This is a big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want us to pray. <laughs> Say a little prayer for me. <laughs> we risk madness. If you think Schlotterdijk is difficult, this is just as difficult, if not more so, especially since it's from another culture. So mm, right. I think we're going to be really challenged. And then if we want to go to phones, I think we'll be um, very, <laughs> I think we'll be very well trained in, mm -hmm. uh, in, a co in comparing and contrasting these different traditions. And in the meantime, there's this insanity. <laughs> which one is that? J.M. Roberts, <laughs> which I'm actually almost finished. But I mean, so that's, I've got projects going on right. underneath that as well. But yeah. I'm sure we all do. But, you know, committed. All right. So here's the, it's Thursday, Let's, May 31st, be an introductory meeting for uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo reading groups. Life Divine and whatever else, okay. um, but likely including Synthesis of Yoga, Savitri. Uh, otherwise, read whatever you want and share it on the forum because we'll come back to it. Uh, right. Somebody will come back to it or uh, us ourselves in some mutated form will come back to it. And uh, it's not a matter of linear time uh, only. Uh, and so... Um, uh, that's, uh, that's, 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 I suppose all, um, anything else? That's it. Awesome. Thanks guys. Yeah. Hey, like I said, no Valium and I got <laughs> it just fine. You didn't pass out. <laughs> I, I love what everybody brought to this really. Um, yeah, this is really good. From the, you know, from the curmudgeon, you know, to, uh, you know, the, loopy speculations to the everything everything that we each brought to it um i'm really happy and i'm really feeling like i need to go back and this is terrible talk about like sanity like i feel like i need to re-listen to this all yeah and i think it's a great project it'll take a while yeah. <laughs> but i think i need to resynthesize it in my in myself or reintegrate everything this group the previous groups um I think I may have, I definitely missed a lot <laughs> uh, and there's, there's more to learn. So um, that's, that's not a commitment or a promise exactly, but uh, it, it, it presents itself as um, like, I, like we've generated something like we've generated some richness, you know, of thought of, every a feeling of c culture we've created culture you know that's what we i think we've done and like we have artifacts to to show for it you know that we could revisit and kind of use to recreate culture and um i found it that it was really this is really good to do i really like doing this yeah. this is like co like this makes me feel healthier and stronger so it's that's like right that's right co immunological every day in every way we're getting better and better as they oh, say, so. may it be. <laughs> honor and a privilege. <laughs> yeah. All what right. They say in Battlestar Galactica, so say we all. <laughs> Thank oh. you. That, that's what they Thank say. you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.